everyone, welcome back to the Imperial Minis channel. This is Randall, and welcome to part 3 in our 3 part series on Faction Identity in the A Song of Ice and Fire Tabletop Miniatures game. This series is intended for both new and veteran players alike, provides a tactics deck focused overview of each faction's identity and playstyle. This should give new players a better idea of which faction or factions align with their desired playstyle, and gives experienced players an idea of which factions they might decide to add to their collection. In this final video in the series, I will cover the two newest factions to the game, House Bolton and the Brotherhood Without Banners. These two factions are designated as mini-factions, which means that they will not have as many units released for them as the main factions of the game. They're likely to only have the units they're initially released with, and then perhaps another box or two at some point in the future. Since there are fewer commander options available to these two mini-factions, I will, unlike in the previous two installments of the series, also do a Commander Tactics card identity review. This will give you an idea of how these faction's commanders alter the identity of the faction, building upon existing strengths or covering up some of their weaknesses. I may expand this series in the future to give the same treatment to the other factions in the game. In A Song of Ice and Fire, factions each have a base tactics card deck of two copies of seven cards for a total of 14 cards. When you select a commander for your army, that commander brings along with him or her an additional two copies of three more cards for a grand total of 20 cards in your tactics deck. Each commander's tactics cards give a unique flair to the base deck, shaking up the faction's playstyle or doubling down on what makes it strong. For this review, I've broken down tactics card identity into a set of six characteristics. Control, damage, healing, movement, protection, and tokens. Some tactics cards will only have one of these characteristics, while others may have several. At the end of each faction review, I will tally up the total number of each characteristic found in the deck, and then show what the overall identity looks like, and summarize some pros and cons of each deck. This should give folks a good high-level idea of how each faction plays and what to expect when playing them. Some cards will also have a conditional banner on them, to show cards that are either highly situational in their use, or those that require some condition to be met before the card does anything. I'll provide a conditionality rating for each deck in the faction review. After each commander review, I'll give an additional faction identity roll-up, including those commander's cards, to, to show how their deck affects the overall faction identity. In the first installment of the series, I explained each of these card categories in some detail, so I won't repeat that here out of consideration for the time of those who have already heard it. If you haven't seen the previous installments of the series, feel free to pause or rewind these category slides to learn more about them. Now we'll move on to our first faction, the brutal, treacherous, and despicable House Bolton. This faction launched in the fall of 2023 as the first mini-faction of the game. It's long been a fan favorite, and Bolton units are some of the strongest neutral units in the game. It felt only right that they get their own faction. Their journey since release has been a rough one, however, but they have been making slow but steady progress with each subsequent game update. Taking a look at the first three cards, what jumps out at you right away are a couple of things. First of all, there are two conditional tags here. So, Remorseless Examples, this is one of those cards that uh, we've seen before in the Targaryen deck, uh, in the Queen of Marine deck, and as a Targaryen player myself, it's always been a card that's difficult to use, and I never really get much out of, and ends up just getting discarded most of the time. So this one's conditional because you either have to have attacked and destroyed an enemy rank just to put a panic token on them, or kill an enemy completely, and then drop a corpse pile. So the, the corpse pile thing is cool, but it doesn't come into play very often. Um, also, Sadistic Games... This is one I put as conditional because it gives the opponent two options and uh, you really need there to be uh, an enemy that is engaged with one of your units. Otherwise, this card is pretty much useless because um, the way it's written, if you don't have one enemy engaged with one of your units, your opponent can just pick that option and then this card does nothing. So this one's conditional on, uh, on the condition that you have to have an enemy engaged currently. And then looking at the characteristics of these cards, the categories, uh, all three of them have a damage component to them. Remorseless examples in the uh, fact that it adds um, a panic, panic wounds. Our blades are sharp, gives you uh, precision. And uh, then sadistic games can hand out panic tokens and then uh, could also throw hits out. Now looking at the next three set of cards, you will see conditional banners all over the place. So, uh, a flayed man has no secrets. This is actually a pretty strong card. Uh, this was, I believe, in the Roost Bolton neutral deck originally. This allows you to cancel a uh, an effect, the effect of an ability or tactics card that is uh, uh, being used by your opponent. 
It does have an, a conditional banner on it though because it does require a condition token to be expended uh, in order for that to happen and you may not have a condition token where you need it to uh, get the effect. Cruel Methods. This is one that uh, requires you to expend a panic token. So it's conditional in that it requires a panic token to be on that unit. Now, as the Bolton player, you're probably going to have a pretty good supply of panic tokens out there, but still, this is conditional because uh, it's going to require a little bit of setup. And then Fear Keeps a Man Alive. This is also conditional because it requires your opponent to fail a panic test. So into certain factions, that might not be that big of an issue, uh, but into other factions or other army lists, that could really be a problem for you. Uh, also, there are just the, the fickleness of dice that might conspire against you here to have your opponent just be rolling hot all game. Um, and as for the categories on these, Flayed Man ha Has No Secrets is kind of one of those hard control abilities that just tells your opponent, no, you can't do that. Cruel Methods throws out uh, tokens or does some burst healing. You know, this one's good for healing uh, up to four wounds. And Fear Keeps a Man Alive, another good one where you can heal three or four wounds usually um, uh, when your opponent fails a panic test. And then moving on to the best card, in my opinion, this is the kind of the quest card for House Bolton, uh, but it doesn't really re require any setup uh, or any tokens being put on it, unlike some of the other quest cards. So with this, this one, Harsh Punishments, you just throw it onto one of your friendly combat units, and then for the rest of the game, that unit will always roll its highest attack die and have Sundering. Uh, the only downside is that when you fail a panic test, you suffer plus one wound, which as far as I'm concerned, is a really easy payoff for such a good game-long game, game long buff uh, for that unit. So that's definitely going to be a, uh, a damage category card, and for me this is going to be the best card in the deck. It used to be worse in that I believe it gave you a panic token immediately also, but uh, that part of it was removed, and uh, now it's an even better card. Now looking at the Bolton Tactics deck roll-up, uh, what, what kind of jumps out at you right away is that deck conditionality rating. So this is the highest rating we've seen yet in the game, 71%. So 71% of all of the entire deck requires is conditional in one way or another. You know, it has requires some setup. Uh, there's conditions on when it can be played. So I, I think ultimately that is really one of the biggest weaknesses of the Bolton Tactics deck. You know, we can look at the categories and what it provides and what it doesn't provide, but I think the biggest weakness is just that conditionality, that there's just too much uh, setup or too much uh, that, that needs to happen for your de your cards to really do anything. Now, if, if we want to look at the categories themselves, this doesn't look too much unlike uh, what you would see like in the Starks. So I think this, this mirrors closely what the Starks have other than the healing. I think the healing would then maybe go to uh, perhaps one more tick in the damage and then one into movement, I think. I think maybe one in movement and protection or something, but... Um, just looking at the categories, it's not too uh, too different than what we've seen in some other factions before, but it's really that conditionality that just hurts these uh, these guys so much. I think. Now looking at pros, they have a strong quest card, quest in quotations, because it really isn't a quest card, but it, it kind of serves the same purpose in this deck. Uh, in harsh punishments, there are a couple of sources of burst healing that uh, can really help your units out quite a bit. Uh, and then there is a decent amount of token generation in the deck. And then just, I would say the strongest thing that this this faction has going for it is just the vibes. I mean, every, people just love the, the kind of brutal kind of metal theme that these guys have. I mean, if you just look at the, the image in the background of this, this slide of, you know, these dudes with flails just bashing guys in the face with, with spiky shields and stuff. You know, this is, this is what people play Boltons for. You know, they... Win or lose uh, in the game, they're just a really cool faction to throw out there. And, you know, everybody loves playing the, like, sadistic, crazy bad guys sometimes. So I, I think no matter what happens with this faction, the vibes are just going to be so strong with them that people are going to take them no matter what. All right, now looking at the cons. Uh, in the categories, there were four damage, uh, four little damage bubbles for... Uh, for the for the roll up, but those damage cards are a little bit lacking. One gives precision and maybe rerolls. One 
gives a morale modifier and plus one wound. That's the remorseless examples. That's that's really hard to pull off. Then the other one was the sadistic games where you can get some hits. Um, but for a, a deck that has four cards with some kind of a damage component, they're a little bit lacking. I mean, the best one is harsh punishments, but you can only put that on two of your units, and uh, you've got to somehow fish those out of your deck. Um, and as you saw, the deck is highly conditional. There was a 70 plus percent conditionality rating. Uh, there are some conflicting triggers uh, within the cards in the deck. So, uh, for example, there's a couple of start of any turn triggers. Um, there's uh, the start of enemy turn also conflicts with start of, of any turn. And then uh, there's a there's a high risk of dead cards. So uh, like that remorseless examples I was telling you about. Uh, sadistic games can just be dead if you don't have any units that are engaged in the first round or two of the game. And then there's a high dependency on panic tokens. So if your opponent is able to clear those tokens off with various uh, effects of their own, then you know the Boltons just don't get charged up until there's panic tokens aplenty kind of showered all over your opponent's army. So if they're doing something to either mitigate your, your token generation or if your token generation just isn't uh, what it should be, then the Bolton army is just not going to be as much as it uh, is not going to be doing as much as it could be doing. Now for identity, they are a very panic focused army, so they want to blast panic tokens all over the enemy units. Uh, you, then you use those panic tokens to either help heal your units, cancel the enemy abilities, push the panic damage uh, through when the enemy is performing panic tests, or use them for other effects like uh, what was the the um, drawing a blank uh, our blades are sharp and then uh, other identities uh, so the the boltons are just vulnerable to the kind of fickleness of the dice um, when it comes to panic tests and uh, on the plus side though it is a highly thematic faction and when things do go your way with panic test rolls and when you're drawing the right cards they do feel amazingly fun um, when they when they have a, a solid kind of counter army or counter faction that you're playing against, you can just feel really punished as as a Bolton player, um, feeling you don't really have the tools to push through uh, the effects and abilities you really need to. So moving on to our commander summary, I'm going to try to keep these relatively short, but um, we're going to look at each commander's attachment card, and then their cards, their tactics cards, and then what that, uh, how that affects the base deck. So we're going to start off with uh, Roos Bolton, the head of House Bolton, Lord of the Dreadfort. His attachment card has Spread Fear and Intimidating Presence, which are uh, a great combination to help him push panic damage through, and uh, then to, to kind of ping-pong panic tests around uh, to his opponents and, and the other army. And then if we look at his cards, these are the three cards, and I've, I'm going to highlight the one that I think is the best of uh, each of these commander's tactics cards. So you'll see a pattern here with Roos. He's very uh, token generation heavy, and he's very control heavy. So Whispered Threats is a control card in that it makes your opponent make a difficult decision about whether to actually use their NCU and then suffer some, some uh, tokens, or whether to just pass with that NCU. And seeing their flaws, also a uh, control card, also panic, or uh, excuse me, also a token generation card. And then Dreadfort Secrets is a card that you can attach to uh, to one of your friendly units to have kind of a persistent uh, source of panic token generation, which is pretty cool. And now moving on to the roll-up for Roos Bolton's deck, you can see he contributes quite a bit to the control of the Bolton deck, which is one of the things that makes him a very popular and uh, I would say more stable commander in the Bolton deck. He has some control mechanics that are easy to pull off. Uh, he also amps up the token generation quite a bit, so he reduces a little bit of that conditionality of the deck. It does still have a high conditionality rating just because they are a lot of effects still are dependent on certain tokens and certain conditions, but uh, Roos adds more uh, more generation opportunities for some of those tokens. So he can kind of make the, the list a little bit less reliant on uh, some of the conditionality. Now moving on to Ramsey Snow, the Spiteful Heir. His commander attachment card comes with Horrific Visage and Prey on Fear. So it, he was recently changed to add Prey on Fear, which is, which is a pretty great uh, change in my opinion. And uh, with 
horrific visage. He, his whatever unit he's in is a unit that your opponent does not want to attack because they're always going to be suffering a panic check whenever they attack him in melee. And moving on to his cards, the best card for me is Skin Collection. This is another card you can staple onto a unit for the rest of the game. And once it's charged up, it gives that unit a, uh, a minus two to any to the um, to the morale of any unit they're engaged with. So uh, it's also one of these kind of cool card names. I you know skin collection. You can just imagine as your army is is kind of grinding through the enemy, they're just strapping on pieces of the enemy's bodies onto their shields and stuff, and uh, justifiably lowering the morale of their uh, their opponents. So it's very thematic in that sense, and that's definitely a damage card because it reduces the morale of your opponents. So they are gonna fail more panic tests and then opportunist this is a card that was lifted over from his neutral version and gives him uh possible rerolls precision uh and vicious and then spoils and flesh is another healing card this is kind of a uh similar to a fueled by slaughter uh card in a tactics card version and if uh when a friendly unit completes a melee attack if it destroyed a rank then one enemy or one friendly unit in short range of the attacker restores one wound plus one for each def of the defender's destroyed rank. So this is a little different than Fuel by Slaughter, which only targets the actual attacker that's dealing the damage. This one can allow a unit to kind of act as a field medic and heal one of your other friendly units, and similar similar to kind of like a rally cry sort of ability. And then looking at Ramsey's uh, tactics deck focus. He adds a couple of damage cards, and then he adds one healing card. So uh, he doesn't do anything for tokens or control. He doesn't really do much for the conditionality of the deck, uh, but he does kind of amp up the damage potential a little bit. He helps out with uh, units failing panic tests by uh, stapling that skin collection card onto units, and then he adds another source of healing. So your, uh, your Bolton army will have a little bit more survivability and endurance because as we can see, none of these commanders so far have had any protection abilities whatsoever. Uh, and spoiler alert, the next one isn't going to either. All right, now moving on to the final Bolton commander, who's probably my favorite because he kind of complements my desired playstyle, is Steel Shanks Walton, the commander of the guard. Uh, he was also recently changed to give him Sundering, which is awesome. Uh, like I said in a, a video I did with the Hits and Crits channel, the guy's carrying like this eight foot long boar spear. The fact that he did, didn't have Sundering already, I, I feel like was a grave injustice on this this portly fellow. Um, he has Iron Resolve, which is good because a lot of Bolton units are uh, kind of mid to low morale. And then he has this odd shared fear ability where when his unit fails a panic test, he can kind of do an AOE of uh, panic tokens to everybody around him. And then looking at his cards, one of them is conditional, price of fear, because it depends on an enemy failing a panic test. Um, but I think that this card is quite interesting and uh, unique in the Bolton deck in that it, it grants free movement. Uh, I, I really like this card. It allows you to do some really cool setup. Um, you know, like you have one of your frontline units cause an enemy to fail a panic test and then allow your, your Bolton Bastard Girls to get a free maneuver into an enemy flank or allow your relatively slow... Flayed men to get a maneuver into a flank or something. So you can do some cool setup um, moves with this Price of Fear. And then my favorite card in the deck is Rush of Aggression because uh, it, it takes all the chance out of getting a long bomb charge. So these, this gives them a guaranteed long bomb six uh, charge distance roll and gives them crit blow. It also allows for the super janky fun Golden Company Elephant combo that I'm always searching for where you get an automatic six charge and get crit blow to potentially, if all the stars aligned right and they've never aligned right for me with the elephant, but you could, if you rolled sixes on all of your, your dice, you could just completely just curb stomp an entire infantry tray or cavalry tray. Uh, and then finally Taunt, which is another uh, another good way to throw some tokens out there. Uh, a little bit of a control card, I guess, uh, but most people, it's not going to dissuade most people from doing what they're going to do anyway, so I, I didn't give it a control uh, control tag, because most people, they're going to do what they want to do, whether you taunt them or not, so more than anything, it's a it's a token generation card. And then looking at the deck roll-up, 
he has a little bit of something for a few categories. The, there's the damage that you can get from Rush of Aggression, which can be uh, great. You know, the damage both in the fact that it guarantees your charge and the crit blow that it gives you. Price of Fear, having movement in the Bolton faction is amazing. And then that little bit of token generation from Taunt is, uh, is also pretty, pretty good. So that's going to do it for the Boltons. And now we're going to move on to the Brotherhood Without Banners. Now moving on to the last faction in this series. And the newest faction in the game, as of the time this video was produced, the Brotherhood Without Banners. So the Brotherhood is a band of mostly common folk who are led by a small but zealous contingent of knights who are disillusioned with the uh, wider fight for the Iron Throne. And these knights aim to protect the small folk from the depredations of the ignoble great houses that are vying for control of the Seven Kingdoms. I have previously covered the Brotherhood's tactics deck in some detail in a separate video, so I won't cover the, that same ground all over again in detail. Since producing that video, that previous video, however, I have tweaked my tactics card categories somewhat, so this review will be a little bit more fine-tuned. All right, looking at our first set of three cards, we have a, uh, a mix of some protection, movement, healing, and token generation here. Uh, Sudden Retreat is, also, is a movement and protection card. Regroup and Reform, pretty classic uh, healing card in that it allows you to transfer wounds around and a, and a potential attachment. Azora High is a uh, very strong either morale auto pass, or excuse me, panic auto pass, or a wound mitigation. And uh, then a potential, has the potential to add a token if it's your commander's unit that passes the test, but uh, it, it's not a card you're relying on for a token. You're relying on it more for the wound mitigation or auto pass. And then moving on to the second set of cards here. These are all a bit conditional. Uh, two of them are conditional in that they require your unit to pass a morale test. That is, the Knights of the Hollow Hill and take up the sword. Uh, but the Brotherhood faction does benefit quite a bit from morale tests for uh, reasons of the faith mechanic. And uh, some of the attachments have abilities that you, know, you can heal after passing in a morale test. Then the middle card there, but the realm remains. This is your, uh, your quest card for the Brotherhood Without Banners that can... Uh, with with one token, it can allow you to make a unit completely immune from receiving condition tokens, which is amazing. Or if you need to, you can use that order token to heal that unit three wounds. So uh, across these three cards here, we have two sources of healing and take up the sword and but the realm remains. We have one token gen card with take up the sword, and we have protection in from the but the realm remains in the immunity to condition tokens. In the Knights of the Hollow Hill, that one is control and movement because you can you can cancel the effect of uh, an ability or tactics card and you get a free three inch maneuver action. And then looking at the card that I think is the best, it's the Forgotten Fellowship. So this card is a start of round card that allows you to have one of your units perform a march or retreat action and then become weakened, but you know, the weakened aspect isn't isn't that damaging considering what you're getting here. You're getting a get out of jail free card potentially by retreating out of uh, out of a melee at the top of the round, which could possibly deny your your opponent the chance the chance to take the um, take the sword and hit one of your units, uh, or a march that would allow you to possibly get into an opponent's flank or rear. So this one here, I'm marking it as as movement and protection. Movement because you get the march and retreat, or march or retreat, and then protection because uh, the retreat, in, in my view, should be treated as uh, both a movement and a protection ability because it can keep one of your units alive. Uh, so now let's look at the roll-up itself. And uh, like I said earlier in the video, uh, in this segment, we've already looked at these cards and we've had a roll-up before in a previous video, but in that video I had the healing and protection uh, categories combined into uh, a survival category. So this is a little bit more granular look than in that previous video, but you can still see that the focus on in this faction is movement and survival. So we just have one control mechanic. We have a couple of sort of weak token gen cards that aren't anything you're going to rely on too heavily, uh, but the core of this, this deck is definitely in that healing, movement, and protection realm. I would say probably movement and protection is, is going to be the biggest uh, theme here. And uh, the healing is definitely welcome in a faction that that has 
peasants as its core troops, has very lightly armored archers. Um, so this is a this is a faction that definitely wants to kind of survive and have lots of tricks up its sleeve to get out of trouble and uh, heal itself up after it gets into trouble. All right, now for the pros. Uh, like I just mentioned, it's very survival. It's a very survival focused faction with several healing cards. It has that panic auto pass or wound mitigation card in Azora High. There's a couple of retreat cards: sudden retreat and uh, what's the other one? The forgotten fellowship. Uh, so the deck, it promotes the use of peasants, which I think is a pro, because it's a pretty cool mechanic. And, uh, and other kinds of chaff infantry, especially for use with regroup and reform. It, uh, it's also a deck that encourages a lot of movement, including out-of-activation movement, such as Sudden Retreat and that uh, Forgotten Fellowship card. So uh, moving on to the cons, there are no damage cards to speak of in the, in the tactics deck, um, but... As we've seen before, uh, there are other other ways that this faction does damage. You don't need the cards necessarily from the base deck to provide you damage. And we're going to see from the commanders in a moment that they're going to bring some damage cards themselves. There is very limited token gen in the deck. And a relatively high level of conditionality, especially for a couple of cards uh, that will require morale tests to be passed before you can get those effects. So, um, so yeah, there's a little bit of, of conditionality to them, but... Uh, the, the faction does have pretty decent morale, and you do have some, some ways to, to help mitigate that. So moving on to the identity, uh, you're going to, unless you're kind of skewing more elite and not focusing at all on peasants, you're going to be kind of using cheap infantry to keep your more expensive units alive, and then rely on morale tests to uh, allow you to get some heals in, cancel enemy abilities, and then uh, this faction is really is really designed to endure and um, not not do so through necessarily heavy armor, but more through healing and kind of tricky movements and uh, kind of doing some unexpected things. And they do have pretty decent morale for a unit or for an army that has uh, peasants as one of its core units. Uh, there are also very strong in faction attachments and NCUs that uh, will definitely help make the army's units well, much more durable and lethal. Now, looking at our first commander, Beric Dondarrion, the Lightning Lord. Uh, so, I'll say off the bat, he's probably going to be my favorite commander, uh, both thematically and just from his set of cards. So, he uh, he has a pretty amazing commander attachment. Sentinel and Pathfinder together are just spectacular to allow him his unit to take free charges, free maneuvers, without any regard at all for the conditions, the battlefield conditions, uh, like terrain. He could charge or maneuver over stakes, bogs, anything. Um, and now, moving on to his cards. The best card in his uh, of his three, to me, is Assault Orders, getting a free melee attack action, or if it's his unit, getting a free charge. He also comes with Lightbringer, uh, so after he completes a melee attack, you can target uh, one enemy in short range of the attacker, and then it suffers a panic test. So you can kind of double panic test a unit after you attack them. Um, and if it's barracks unit, you get it. You can even make them panic beforehand. And then six times too many. This is kind of a uh, survival card. So after if, if his unit would be would be destroyed by a melee attack, they remain in play. Well, when any unit would be destroyed by a any infantry unit, excuse me, would be destroyed. They stay in play with one wound, but then have kind of some strings attached to him. Uh, but if you look at his cards here, unlike the base deck, he has a couple of damage abilities. So if we look at the roll-up, uh, you get two damage cards in there, and you get a little bit more protection, a little bit more token gen. So he definitely makes the, the deck a little bit more well-rounded. Uh, those damage cards are, in particular, uh, very welcomed, uh, allowing him free attacks, which are, which is amazing, and that Lightbringer card allowing for some uh, kind of spiking, either spiking damage on one unit in particular, or kind of spreading uh, panic damage around to another unit. So now we're going to move on to our next commander, that is Thoros of Mir, the Red Wizard. Now looking at his commander attachment card, he has this pray, Prayers to R'hllor ability. This is a R'hllor faith mechanic uh, that y'all might be familiar with from the Baratheon uh, Stannis loyalty. 
and uh, his this ability gives his unit plus two to morale test rolls, and he begins the game with one faith token. And anytime that unit passes a morale test, which a morale test is uh, either a morale test or a panic test, and uh, if if that test is passed, then he gets another token. And then he can do some cool stuff with these tokens. Um, but it, even if you just disregard the tokens, he gives that unit plus two morale, which is great. So basically, gives them stalwart. Um, so you could even put him in a unit of peasants, and those peasants go from a six plus morale to a four plus morale. And uh, now let's look at his three cards. To me, the best one here is Fiery Charge. This shouldn't be any surprise to folks that uh, remember that my favorite card from Steel Shanks Walton was the Rush of Aggression. I love any card that gives me a guaranteed six to charge. Um, also, I'm going to say it again, this this then makes me think uh, Thoros is the man who might be able to make a uh, Golden Company Elephant list possible. So, you know, whenever I see this kind of a card... Uh, it always makes me quite excited. Now, I, I would have preferred to get crit blow on the charge rather than just panicking something on the charge, but, you know, I'll take a, a guaranteed six charge wherever I can find it. And Loved by the Small Folk, this one's conditional because it uh, it requires the enemy to fail a morale test. So this could be a card you play and it just ends up doing nothing. And then the last kiss, this is, a, uh, this is an ability to save an attachment from being destroyed, so that would be either when the attachment is uh, killed because the whole unit gets killed, or an attachment gets sniped with um, Expert Duelist, or if you're even destroying the unit yourself by regrouping and reforming the last few ranks, or last few wounds of a unit, um, you can use this to save that attachment. And uh, taking a look at the roll-up here, Thoros adds uh, a couple of token gen cards, a couple of protection cards, and one damage card in the Fiery Charge. So he's kind of leaning a little bit more into protection and token gen uh, with just a little bit of, uh, of damage with the Fiery Charge. But his commander attachment card is definitely, uh, is definitely interesting. It could give that unit Sundering and Vicious. Uh, it also has a healing ability. So you know, if you factor in his... Commander attachment, you could easily just kind of imagine the healing uh, of his of his uh, when he's in play to, to be going up as well. Um, but that's it for Thoros of Mir. All right, and last but certainly not least is Catelyn Stark, Lady Stoneheart. So looking at her commander attachment, this is uh, kind of the classic dream combo of uh, spooky attachments. So you've never before been able to get horrific visage and intimidating presence on one attachment card. You can get it in a unit by, you know, for example, having Bolton Blackguard with uh, Roos Bolton Commander in them or something, but you never see it all on one card. So this is definitely a, wh whatever unit she goes into is definitely not a unit you, as the opponent, are going to want to attack because they're going to be, you know, doing some pretty serious panic damage to you potentially. And now taking a look at her cards... Uh, so when I, I, I had made some early predictions about what Lady Stoneheart would, would bring to the table, I had predicted it would be a mix of control and damage, um, but it seems I overestimated her control potential and maybe underestimated her damage potential, because she's definitely a damage-focused commander. So she has a couple of cards that we've seen before in other decks, and then only one new card, but uh, the cards, kind of the, the whole package you see here is definitely very... Uh, kind of retributive in nature and uh, very aggressive. So Lash Out allows, uh, allows one of your units to throw wounds, just direct wounds right back at your opponent after they attack you. Uh, and then if it's, if it's Lady Stoneheart's unit, then that unit also picks up a Panic Token. Price of Failure uh, is an amazing card, especially in a faction that can uh, use Lance Cavalry to charge into a gang up to potentially, uh, you know, you could potentially get double digits of, of dice with uh, with this faction, and then you've also, um, yeah, you can you can do some crazy things with this card. It's a, definitely a damage card, and uh, then Vengeance and Blood is the most interesting card that she has. Uh, I've made it my favorite card or the best card, but uh, depending on the situation, you could you could also say Price of Failure could be uh, the best card if you're in a running a list where you've already planned to maybe have a 
10, 10 plus dice attack that you uh, use price of failure on, but Vengeance in Blood can allow uh, one of your units to get a free maneuver or march action, which can put, put a unit straight into the flank or into the rear of an enemy to set them up for a devastating attack. Or if it's Catelyn's unit, then you can perform a charge or attack action instead. So uh, it's pretty crazy and for the combos it opens up here. Uh, it also kind of argues for maybe putting Catelyn in a ranged unit. You know, you could put her in an archer unit or uh, Golden Company archers or even the Brotherhood archers. So one of your units in the front line gets attacked, you throw this card down, and then Catelyn's unit can just fire into the melee for free. Uh, so looking at the roll-up, you can see she she brings three damage cards, so each one of her cards is a damage card, and then she brings uh, one of one of those cards also doubles as a movement card, and then one just has a very minor token uh, component to it. But overall, she is definitely I'd say the heaviest in uh, in damage and damage in multiple ways. You know, there's active damage, there's passive damage. So the the lash out is kind of a it's a reactive passive damage that you're, you're directly throwing out. Price of failure is an active, uh, is active damage, and then the vengeance and blood is also kind of a reactive damage. So she's definitely a damage focused commander, but uh, damage that's kind of uh, more weighted towards reactive and retributive, which is definitely in character for her. So uh, very cool stuff. Well, that does it for part three and for the Faction Identity series as a whole. I hope my viewers have found this series useful for taking a high-level look at Faction Identity through the lens of the Faction's Tactics decks. My goal was for these videos to be a starting point for new players to see which factions might appeal to them, and to show veteran players which other factions they might be interested in trying based on their preferred playstyle. Like I said earlier in the video, I might expand the series in the future to cover the Commander's Tactics decks and Identity from each of the other factions in the game, if there is sufficient interest in such a thing. Due to the volume of commanders, tactics cards, and discussion involved, I might have to do uh, one video per faction, or maybe two videos per faction, just to keep the videos at a manageable length. Let me know in the comments if this would be of any interest or value to you. If you enjoyed this video, please consider throwing it a like, and uh, give me your feedback in the comments. I'd like to know what, what other folks think about these commanders, about these armies, and about my overall take on them. And if you haven't already, I'd love if you would subscribe to the channel so you can be notified of any future videos. And until next time, this is Randall, signing off.